the gospel this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 2. And I believe in your, in your um, bulletins it says verses 1 through 12. Is that right? Yes? Okay, good. Like, why are we printing out bulletins? I don't understand. We're not... I'm going to take it, however, to verse 18. Because as I look through the lectionary, it will not ever be read this year. And if you leave it out, um, you leave out a major portion of what Matthew was trying to relate. So this is Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Christ would be born. <clears throat> In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. This is the other part of the reality. After they had were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, flee. To Egypt and stay there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and escaped to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod's death, so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A, vo a voice was heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they are no more. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated as we go into the word today. <clears throat> I've entitled uh, today's message, A Tale of Two Kingdoms. And you see the two kingdoms play out in today's text. In fact, the language that is used is all kingdom language. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? They did this during the time of King Herod. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, etc. 
And then they, the Jewish leadership quotes the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means among the rulers, because out of you will come a ruler. It's all kingdom language. And I'd like to focus today on the reality of the two kingdoms. You see, everything in life is a manifestation of some kind of kingdom. It defines us, it influences us, and depending on how we participate, it can own us. Let's pray as we go into the word. Lord, please open up our hearts and minds as we go into your word today, that we may be able to walk in your kingdom, the kingdom that you proclaimed through your son, the kingdom that you gave to your son, and in his name we too belong. Teach us about this truth, this reality. Let us not be ignorant or naive or in the dark of the reality between your kingdom and the kingdom of this world. And may we give glory to you as we learn and walk in the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Everything in our lives through every generation of all humanity has been lived within the context of various kingdoms. Now, before we get into it, since it sometimes can be a confusing subject, it's not taught about near as much, I think, as it should be. But a kingdom is simply whatever you have say over. That's what it is. There's structure to it, but ultimately the definition that I think is easiest to remember is whatever I have say over is my kingdom. Whatever you have say over is your kingdom. Whatever other people or a group of people or a nation of people have say over, it's their kingdom. This is the only message that Jesus proclaimed. It was consistent throughout his ministry, and everything that he taught was in regards to this kingdom. If we don't know the kingdom, we do not understand the gospel. We may get parts of it, but not in its entirety. And so understanding the kingdom is essential. It is imperative. It's not about getting to heaven, although that is included. That is not the foundational aspect of it. The foundational aspect is the kingdom. Jesus did not say, I am proclaiming to you a way to get to heaven. I proclaim a kingdom. So understanding what it is is very important. A king, and we don't have kings now, although we live in kingdoms. Everything that we experience in life from the moment that we're born until the moment we leave this world is within the context of various kingdoms. So you come into this world, and the first kingdom that you experience or that you become aware of that you have say over is your body. And when you, as you develop and as you grow, you hopefully are able to develop say over your body. And it's very cute. You ever see a two-year-old learn to, to walk? You just watch it, so, it's so cute. Oh, you can do it. You know, when they get to that little, when they get propped up, they're only going to walk, you know, maybe five feet or something. You're like, you can do it. That's kingdom building. It's exactly what it is. And once you ascertain it, you don't want to lose it. And if you begin to lose it, you start to go through some things. You might need a cane. I don't know of anyone that joyfully goes, this is great. I get to use a walker. No. You got to work with this stuff because it's part of the earthly kingdom that you were able to acquire early on being, to a degree, taken away. Then you would grow up in a kingdom, a home, hopefully. You have parents, 
and depending on what they have say over and their values and their practices and their customs and how they behave with each other, how they raise you, you are influenced by their kingdom. There's nothing more powerful than how your parents have raised you. It's kingdom influence. And then while you grow up in that home, you go to the school and the schools are a kingdom They have say over what you do. Teachers have say. Principals have say. Superintendents have say. And you experience their influence. Everything is a kingdom. Everything. If you take a look at your entire life and look at it through the lens of kingdoms, you can see every single one. When you go to work, now you have a kingdom. And you better figure out that kingdom because you don't want to upset your boss. And you learn how to work within the kingdom. No, 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 no. In this kingdom, you can't say that. In this kingdom, you can only say this. In this kingdom, you have to be on time. You can't be late in this kingdom. I have say over it. And everything that we experience is within the context of various kingdoms. You get sick and you all of a sudden need to see a doctor. You are thrown into a kingdom. Please Hold, beep, beep, beep. Oh, man, I was just, I'm sorry, this is the wrong department. You have to call this one. Now you're getting a rat race in a kingdom. But it's a kingdom. You don't have say over it. It has say over you. And it feels good, doesn't it? It can be if it's run properly. Kingdoms are what? rule everything. We don't call them kingdoms, though, so we can lose, fat, lose sight of the fact that they are. We don't call them kingdoms. We call them corporations. We call them institutions. We call them conglomerations. We have different terms for it, but it's the same reality. It's a kingdom. AT&T has a kingdom. Google is a kingdom. The medical establishment is a kingdom. Our government is a kingdom. We don't call it that bureaucracies, if you will, but the principles are the exact same. Whoever has say over something else. Cities are kingdoms. Counties are kingdoms. States are kingdoms. And you may learn how to work in this kingdom and then cross the state line. Oh, it doesn't work in this kingdom. Oh, no, no, no. We, We don't run our way. This kingdom is a different kingdom. So, Understanding our life. You can take a look at every aspect of your life this today, and everything is within the context of a kingdom. You wake up, turn on the TV, that's a kingdom. The media corporation, whatever it happens to be, the radio station, whatever website, it's a kingdom. You go and you get some food. It's been brought to you, or hopefully you purchased it at a store. That's a kingdom. It has say over things. Everything, coming here and and going on the roads, The people that put in the roads, that maintain the roads, there's a structure. It's a kingdom. And if you don't like that there's a lot of potholes, you got to figure out who has say over your roads. And then you have to learn how to have say over that person that has say over the roads. And that process can come out in different ways, such as the squeaky wheel gets the grease. It's a way of manipulating a kingdom. This book, this sacred book, is a revelation that reveals to us the ultimate reality that there are only two kingdoms in the entire universe in which every other kingdom is plugged into. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of the enemy, the serpent, Satan, the devil. That's it. Genesis 1, in the beginning God created. It's his kingdom. He has say over it. He speaks and it comes into existence. All through that chapter, it it is revealed that God has created this world as a kingdom. He has say. He gives us instruction and wants us to have say over his kingdom with him. That's why in Genesis 2, God takes all of the animals and says, why don't you name them? Why don't you have say over these animals? You ever name an animal? There's a bond that's created when you name an animal. You have say over it. And if you tend to it, the animal is blessed. And it is very disturbing to see someone be cruel to an animal. 
because they are destroying their kingdom by employing the methods of the enemy's kingdom. So when Jesus comes out and begins to, pre- to, to proclaim the kingdom, one of the first teachings that he does that we refer to as the Beatitudes, blessed are you, because the kingdom is established, and within the kingdom there is blessing. And this book is a book of the two kingdoms that have been in conflict since Genesis 3. And everything that we experience in life, in some way, shape, or form, is tied to, involved in, and participating in those two kingdoms. You may not even think about it because the enemy is so good at distracting you from that reality and getting you focused on the reality of the kingdom in which you're working. Maybe it's a vocation, whatever the case may be. But ultimately, those are the two spiritual kingdoms that manifest themselves in this world. The reason why I made the decision to read through verse 18 is because it is important to never forget that reality. Because once the enemy forgets, it's like a nation that was attacked. And a nation goes to war, and they win that war. But a new generation arises that never experienced it and think that those are the days of old. We are now in a new age where there will be no war, and they do not prepare. It is a natural human tendency to take this story, the account, and to polish it. And it looks really good, and it's even, and it feels good to have order in the kingdom. Whenever there is order, there is a sense of security. That's why the church in and of itself, as an institution, can oftentimes adhere to order for a sense of security over and above security of the kingdom. Let me give you an example of how it can play out. This afternoon, Church of the Master is having their end of existence service. It's called Holy Closure. They're selling off everything and giving all the money to the synod. Now, Church of the Master, I'm aware of, I've had friends there. They did everything right. And it was a beautiful church. Pipe organ, big tall ceiling. I preached there when I was interviewing here. It's got a picture of Jesus holding his hands out. Beautiful picture. My friend Jeff, who was a member there for many years, said, that's when Jesus was fishing in the Galilee. He said, I caught one this big. (laughs) And now that's all I can think about is Jesus as a fisherman, you know. But they did everything perfect, just like Lutherans are taught. And they're closing the door. They sold off all their land because they were so focused on their institutional kingdom, they could not remember that they are involved in the conflict of the ages and the kingdom of God is what they're about, not the kingdom of the Lutheran church. And so it's gone. Gone. Think I'm happy about it? Don't think it can't happen here? Don't think it can't happen anywhere. When we're so focused on structural institution kingdoms over and above the kingdom of God, it will happen. It's not might it happen, it will happen. Because the enemy will come in and use that as a form of idolatry. Sometimes people get more impassioned about change in the church than actually coming together in prayer. Sometimes. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of the enemy has been like this. The kingdom of the enemy we have to fight from day one. From the moment we come into this world, this world is set to try to kill us. Viruses, bacterias, 
plagues, famines, wars, pestilence. That is not God's kingdom. That's a kingdom of the enemy. We just sometimes take it for granted. That's the way of the world. No, that's the way of his world. We belong to a new kingdom, for God has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And whenever that takes place, when that realization takes place, it changes everything. When you take a look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 32, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. This is the kingdom that is proclaimed. This is the reality of following Jesus, this kingdom, and he is the king over this kingdom. Everything about discipleship is not so you can graduate from confirmation, and never enter a church again. It is about learning how to live within the kingdom, how to belong to the kingdom, what the kingdom is about, and how to experience the overflow of the kingdom and give that to other people. In other words, advancing the kingdom. This is the power of the Holy Spirit that was given in Pentecost to advance the kingdom. Not to set up an institution, but to advance a reality that God had been hidden since ages past, but was now revealed through Paul, that God has established once and for all the ruler of his kingdom, and with his death and resurrection, it has been inaugurated. It is here. It will be consummated soon. And the devil would like nothing more than to keep God's people busy doing stupid stuff rather than advancing the kingdom. And I use this term stupid. I didn't mean anything to be offensive. But sometimes it can be. I have a, a friend, Ephraim. Jim knows him, Bible study. I think Ephraim's 23. You know what 23-year-olds like to do? Party. Oh, yeah. How many remember being 23? Let me just think that back. Remember that for a second. His parents, his family, they're going to Cabo. For, I think, a week. Is it a week, Jim? You think so? I think it's a week. He don't want to go. Why would I want to go and hang out with people and drink and talk about nonsense when I can talk about God? That doesn't sound like the kingdom. But what church do you go to? We talk about, oh, I was on vacation, I was doing this, and those are wonderful things. I don't think they're bad. But this is a guy that understands the dynamic of kingdom reality. He struggles with it like we all do, but he's got something that was, how, how easy is it to tell your mom, I don't want to go on vacation with the family to Cabo. I know I'm 23, but I'm really not into drinking and talking about nonsense. That's what we live for in America talking about nonsense rather than the kingdom. Can you imagine Jesus having that conversation? So this reality as we go into the new year is a reality that needs to be remembered over and over again, not to be played with. Not to be messed with, but to understand, as Jesus says, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and the spirit. And the religious leaders, the PhD, say, I don't understand what this means. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, 
but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with every church, every person born of the Spirit. The moment we think we can predict what's going to happen is the moment that the Holy Spirit leaves the building. Go ahead. Make your plans for the whole year. And while Rancho Cordova grows, you'll just stay here. But I will be glorified, and I will have my will done in this community, and I will raise up a people who will set others free in my name. If you want to be a part of it, great. I want that. I long for it. But this is the temptation that has faced every generation since his ascension to forget the big ultimate reality of a tale of two kingdoms really isn't a tale. It's reality of two kingdoms. And we will never, ever find, ever, I was, I don't know if this is true or not, but in the morning I've been hearing over and over and over and over and over and over again, it's an ad to become a, I can't remember the term of it, a wellness coach, I think. Because half of California's youth suffer from mental illness, is what the ad says. Interesting. I wonder if we have anything to say about that. I wonder if God has anything to say about that. I wonder, I wonder if the kingdom has anything to say about that. If you feel convicted, good. I do too. But conviction is not a bad thing. It means determination. And I believe that God is on the precipice of doing something that we can never possibly imagine. And he is creating and preparing a people the way he did with the first disciples with John the Baptist. I am preparing the way of the Lord. Not preparing the way of whatever the case may be of human origin but of the Lord. And nothing's ever been the same since. Thank God. My friends in Christ, may the peace of God, may the joy of the Lord, may his kingdom, if you have not ever experienced it, may you experience it fully. May we be reminded of it. May we long for it. May, be, may it be something that we cannot help but talk about constantly because it is our greatest joy and may we never ever set it aside to replace it with something that we've created even if what we've created has good intentions and may the spirit of the living God move among us that we may glorify our heavenly father and his son, and his Messiah, his Christ, Jesus our Lord. Amen.